welcome to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus with Bob Mendelson. Exodus chapter 11. Now the Lord said to Moses, One more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he'll let you go from here. When he lets you go, he'll surely drive you out from here comprehensively. A complete kalah. It fits all together. Speak now in the hearing of the people that each man ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. Kesef and Zahav can't get any better than that the Lord gave the people favor the Hebrew word chen meaning grace in the sight of the Egyptians furthermore the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt gadol ma'od gadol great ma'od very great extremely but it's not just he was a big tall fella he was extremely esteemed in the land of Egypt both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people Verse 4, Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I am going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones. All the firstborn of the cattle Can I ask you a as well. Sure. The verse 4, Moses said, Who did he say it to? Verse 4, Who is Moses talking to? The Lord speaking to Moses in verse 1. Moses replies, he says this thing in verse 4, and then we see in verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you. So it sounds like it's a conversation like we saw in chapters 3 and 4. But it doesn't make any sense that Moses would say, thus says the Lord to the Lord. So here it is, just imagine it this way. God speaks to Moses. Moses turns to the people. He may turn to Aaron and say it, because remember Aaron in chapter 4 was going to be the mouthpiece of Moses to the people, certainly to Pharaoh and to the people. And then Moses turns back and God tells him some more stuff in verse 9. So it's probable that it's Moses turning to his brother and saying this. There shall be a great cry, verse 6, in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as shall never be again. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these your servants will come down to me and bow themselves down before me, saying, Go out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh. You don't see him telling Pharaoh. You see him telling Aaron, stumbling, see, and then Aaron saying it. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go out of his land. This prophecy of the tenth plague where it's clear that nothing's going to touch the Jews is changed as we look at chapter 12. It says, chapter 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month, Nisan, will be the beginning of months for you. It's going to be the first month of the year. Speak to all the congregation of Israel. This is still God telling Moses. On the 10th of Nisan, everyone should take a lamb for themselves, one lamb for each house. One question. This month, shall be the beginning of months for you. Nisan is the seventh month. It's actually the first. But why did they change it? Who changed it? God's changing it right here. But Tishri is the first month. Well, only in the civil calendar. Yeah. And why do we have a civil calendar? That anniversarizes creation. This is going to anniversarize redemption. So God's giving us a new calendar. If I ask you when you were born, you'd say my birthday is X. If I say when were you born again, You'll say, that birthday is something else. And that anniversarizes redemption. So your creation is one, your redemption is another. So 5,774 years ago, God created the world. And 3,500 years ago, he redeemed the Jewish people from Egypt. If the house is too small, verse 4, for a lamb, then he and his neighbor ought to share. Verse 5, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. Take it from the sheep or the goats and keep it until the 14th of Nisan. Then everyone, all the Jews are going to kill that lamb at the same time at twilight. 
and then they're supposed to take twilight air of evening time. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it, and they eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, with matzahs and with moror, the bitter herbs. Don't eat any of it raw. Don't leave any of it till morning. Whatever's left over, burn with fire. Eat it with your loins girded, sandals on your feet, staff in your hand. You're going to get out of town quickly, so get dressed. Don't relax. Put on your jogging clothes. That's really what this is. Put on your get out of town fast clothing. Verse 11, you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Why? Because I'm going to go through verse 12 and 13. This is so important. I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. So this tenth plague promised in chapter 11 is going to be realized in chapter 12. And I'll execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. Verse 12. God is not happy with the gods of Egypt. And we've looked at some of those. The god of the river Nile, the gods of frogs, that's right, and the gods of darkness and light, the gods of nature, that is hail and thunder. These are all natural gods of the Egyptian people. Think Hindus today. God says, basically, I'm going to bring judgment, final judgment now on the Egyptians. So I've waited, according to the rabbis, a whole year before I've brought them down. And... It's going to happen tonight about midnight against the gods of Egypt. But wait a minute, you say. He's going to execute judgment on the people that is firstborn and the cattle. Firstborn of the cattle. Like cattle did anything wrong? But he's going to execute judgment. Why? Because he's fed up to here. Up to here. For those listening online, I apologize. Up to my neck. To the, ceiling. To the top. That's right. It's going to run over. So he's waited in patience and now I'm done waiting and judgment is going to befall Egypt and the people of Egypt and the master of the people of Egypt that's Pharaoh and his offsiders etc. But it could have happened to anyone who worshipped the gods of Egypt. This is the key. It's not against the Egyptians. It's against the gods of Egypt that God is executing judgment. So when somebody worships a false god then God is not happy with them because they are becoming like the God whom they are worshipping. Does that make sense? When I went to Thailand and Patty and I were there and we were on a tour and the lady who was our tour guide took us to a Buddhist temple and said, here's this and this. And we went in and we did, you know, whatever, you observe stuff. Then she gave us these sticks and said, here, just throw down those sticks and it's kind of a game. And I said, well, where am I throwing them? And she said, oh, towards that Buddha. And I said, would this be considered something like worshipping Buddha? And she said, oh, yes. And I said, here are your sticks. I'm not going to do that. She said, oh, it doesn't mean much. And I said, oh, yeah, it means a lot. You're asking me to worship at a false god. And my wife was squeezing my arm a little like, you know, don't make a scene. <laughs> and, but you're right. Yeah, I did not want to worship. I didn't know what it was. If you're innocent, you do something, you know, fair enough. But this is when God gets really upset when people worship false gods and you become like the god you worship. All right. Which also, by the way, is for us. We become like the God we worship. I'm not saying we're Mormons. You know, the Mormon theology is you become God. That's what they say. The longer you stick around in this religion, Jesus was the consummate Mormon in their religion. And he who was man grew up to become God. Yeah, that's not quite it. And I'm not going to, nor Joseph Smith, nor Brigham Young, nor any anybody, going to become God. God is all by himself, thanks very much. So here he says, against all the gods of Egypt, I'm going to execute judgment. And then verse 13 tells us, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, God says, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this idea of the passing over the houses of the Jewish people. So these Eastern influences are coming against the Jewish people. God says, I'm going to strike down all the false gods. So if you become, by worship, you become like a false god, then you're going to cop the judgment that God's going to bring on the Egyptians. Can I ask you a question? Yes. This putting of blood on the door, would there be an Israelite that would not believe Moses' word and not put the blood on the door? Would there have been some 
disbelievers? Well, think about Moses. Moses, 40 years earlier, he's 80 years old, right? 80, 81 years old. So 40 years earlier, he had this time with the Jewish people. He came out as being the palace prince. You saw the prince of Egypt. So here he is, prince of Egypt, and he looks over and he sees an Egyptian hurting a Jew. And he gets really upset and he kills the Egyptian. The next day, he comes out, he sees two Jewish guys fighting. And he says, hey, stop. And they say to him, what are you going to do? You're going to kill one of us like you did the Egyptian. Now he realizes the email has gone viral and he's in trouble because people know that he has killed somebody. So he runs out of town 40 years before this time. And he's been out there and maybe people have died, maybe people forgot. And then God says to him, go down Moses, burning bush. We've seen that. He goes down and he tells Pharaoh, let my people go. And what was Pharaoh's first response? Who is Yahweh that I should believe him? Tell you what, buddy, you've just made it worse for those people. What did he do? He told the make bricks without straw. Without straw. They had to go collect their own straw. So he doubled the workload, at least double, for the Jewish people. Now, what do you reckon the Jews are thinking Moses is? He's our man or no? He's our ruin. Four decades ago, he killed somebody. He's after us again. And now he comes back and he tries to be a hero. And really, he's a loser. And look what he did to us. Our hero becomes our foil, and we hate him, and get him out of here. So the rabbis say it took not only that year for the Egyptians to be convinced, but it took a year for the Jews to be convinced that Moses was our hero. As a result, I say most Jews, there were certainly three million in the land at that time, would have done what it says here in verse 13, to put the blood on the door. But not necessarily all. If I look at Jewish history and I'm informed by that, then I would say, no, there are going to be some Jews who say, no thanks, I'll be all right. I don't need to follow the religion. I don't need to go along with that Moses guy. We're pretty, we've are pretty. we been good all along. And the distinction, remember, the Egyptians were in darkness and we were in light. And the Egyptians had hail and we didn't have any. So, yeah, we'll be all right. I imagine there were those who said, que sera, sera and whatever will be, will be. And others will have said, no, I don't need to follow the religion. I imagine there were some. Certainly they show up again towards the end of this book. So it's likely that there was a, that it wasn't a monolithic response, that everyone said, yes, sir. So he says now, verse 14, this day will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a chag, a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You're to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance seven days eat matzahs and first day remove the leaven etc so we're looking at chapters 11 and 12 as a unit tonight chapter 11 the 10th plague it's going to happen to these unbelieving people but look who it's going to fall on chapter 11 verse 1 one more plague I'll bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt so why the separation why doesn't it say I'll just bring it on Egypt he is the undoing of his nation He's the responsible one. He's the king. He could have stopped it, and he didn't stop it. The servants we saw last week already said, get these guys out of here. Stop doing it. Let's go along with the program. There is a Yahweh, and he's bigger than you. And so God said, I'm going to bring it on Pharaoh, and, if you will, as a result, on Egypt. Why ten plagues could have been... We don't know why. Ten is just a complete number. Seven's a complete number. Twelve's a complete number. There are certain completion numbers. We don't know why. Ten is a kingdom number, but we don't know why. I mean, people conjecture, but it doesn't say why. It is, in a symphonic way, the climax. It's really a good word for it. One more, and then he'll let you go. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here all the way. Kala. So then he says, tell you what, go next door and spoil the people. That's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? 11-2. Go next door and get the silver and gold from your uh, next door neighbors. You reckon that those neighbors would have been willing to give it away? They would. Yeah. They were, they were afraid of Pharaoh. They were afraid, the army. not of Pharaoh. Of God. Of the Yahweh who ruined their crops, <laughs> ruined their lives, darkness for days. Nothing you know. to eat, nothing to milk. And <laughs> they heard, they read the newspapers, they knew that it was because of the Jews, and they wanted the Jews out. Yeah. And Pharaoh wasn't letting them out. So fine, you want my gold? Here, maybe I can buy you off with this. Tell your God to leave me alone. Silver and gold, which we value a lot, they also had good value in those days. 
what in the world did we need with silver and gold? We're slaves. We're leaving. What do we need silver and gold for? It's We're going to go plunder. to the markets? It's the plunder of the victorious one. Okay, we plunder them. We win. For the tabernacle. For the mishkan. The tabernacle that's going to be built from chapter 25 and following. Yeah, so we're going to need that product as well as to purchase things perhaps in the wilderness on a trade route. But generally speaking, it's for the pouring in for the worship of God in just a few chapters. But you also know what's going to happen in a few chapters with that silver and gold, the golden calf. That's right. And we're going to make the, we're going to worship wrong with the very thing with which we were supposed to be worshiping in a right way. Brothers, sisters, this happens to us with regularity. We have choices to make. Am I going to use what God gives me, whether from my spoiled neighbor or from my employment or in any situation? Am I going to use what is mine, it's already mine, to honor God or to dishonor God? And that'll be a choice we have to make. We talked about choices a couple weeks ago. So the Lord gave people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Verse 3. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and all the people. So who is missing in verse 3? Pharaoh. Yeah. So all the Egyptians, the servants, all the people. Everybody says, Moish, you're a great guy. We love you, Moshe. Except Pharaoh, who is stubborn as. Isn't he? God made him stubborn and he made himself stubborn. We looked at that a few weeks back. That Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. So then about midnight, I'm going in the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn will die. Now, what if an Egyptian... So we read 11 and 12. You ask the question, what if a Hebrew didn't put blood on the door? Let's ask the other question. What if an Egyptian did put blood on the door? Yeah, but we had known it. I I need your gold. We're leaving tonight. Okay, fine. Here's some gold. Where are you going? Yeah, we're going out to the wilderness. We're going to worship God. What are you going to do? How will you get out? Because Pharaoh's not letting you out. Now there's this thing with blood. And uh, we're going to put blood. We're going to kill a lamb and put blood on our door. They're going to be watching. The Egyptians are watching. You reckon there's some Egyptians who put blood on the door? I do too. If I were an Egyptian, I would have said, have some gold. Can I go with your God? I don't know what your God does, but he seems to win. And I want to go with him. And what's the entry ticket? What's the price of the ticket? I'm buying the gold. Okay, here's the gold. And a cow. You want me to kill? No, it's a lamb. Okay, fine. Lamb, what do I do with it? Kill it. Put blood on my door. Babe, I'm pouring it all over the door. Right? So I imagine, and the Bible will bear this out in a few chapters, that there are others along with the Jews who leave Egypt. And that makes sense to me, that they wanted to go with the God who's the real God and not the fake gods who are abundant in Egypt. And so Moses is Gadol Ma'od. Moses said, it's about midnight. I'm gonna. So this idea of midnight is carried on in the Haggadah. And we see this. There's a song that we sing about midnight that this happened and this happened and this happened. And the story is that we left at midnight. We walked through the sea at midnight. Everything happened at midnight. Probably didn't, but it's from this verse. All the firstborn will die. Firstborn of Pharaoh, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who's behind the millstones. Meaning you can't hide anywhere. It's indiscriminate, comprehensive, no one's left out. From the little gal who says, well, I had nothing to do with it. I'm just a slave girl. And I'm even behind a millstone. I'm still working. To the Pharaoh who probably could buy himself out of most trouble. No, everybody. So you can, and you saw it in the movie Ten Commandments, that the son of Pharaoh died. And how horrible was that? I don't know how many children were normal in a family, but let's say that there were ten in a family. That means the firstborn would die, and the firstborn of the firstborn would die, and the firstborn of the secondborn, and the firstborn of the thirdborn. There were so many people dead all over Egypt that the cry would have been relentless, as painful to hear as the shriek around the fallen buildings in 9-11. Just like the beginning? So at the death of the innocent, as we called it in chapter 1 of Exodus, death of children is probably one of the worst ever. In the last six months, I have been part of ministry teams talking to parents who've buried their children, most recently, just two weeks ago. And there's nothing you can say. I look at their updates on Facebook. I look at their lives and they are aching to this day. They're still, why? 
why me, why him, why her, you know, and these are parents my age or younger. One gal out in Sydney Southwest who almost daily expresses her pain about the loss of her child. I talked about her a couple months ago at One New Man when we talked about grief. And I see this a lot. So if you imagine 80 years ago, you lost your child, you're a Jew. There aren't going to be many of those. One of the questions last night at One New Man, why a million children died in the Holocaust. Try to explain that enough that somebody believes you who's lost a child. It's impossible. Yeah, so that's good. It's a good point. The crying of the children at the beginning of the book and the crying of the parents here over the death of their children, it's echoing. And it says in verse 6, there shall be a great cry and saka, this crying in all the land of Egypt is a shroud like the darkness was a shroud, like the hail was a shroud, like the blood was a shroud. There is a constant layer upon layer of judgments against the land of Egypt because they're false, because they worshiped wrong. And it says that in verse 7, not anything is going to bark against the Jews. So in light of that, you'd think, well, I'm, we're not touchable, so I don't need to do the lamb blood thing. That would be one who doesn't want to be effusive in love and worship towards God. So we see 11.9, we see that Pharaoh, Moses is told, will not listen. Pharaoh will not listen to you so that everything will be accomplished and all these wonders will happen before Pharaoh. So verse 10, Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders. What are those? Those are all 10. It's not the last one is all, but it's a statement of the summary of the last several chapters. And you can almost hear God's sadness. I hope you hear that. There are those who talk about people who don't believe in Jesus are going to hell. And you've heard preachers, perhaps, get up and bang pulpits and say, you know, if you don't accept Christ, you're going to hell. And some people, I want to tell you, are actually pleased to tell people that they're going to hell. Maybe they gain their own sense of self-worth from the proclamation against other people. But if you know somebody in your family, in your neighborhood, in your sphere of influence, who doesn't believe in Jesus, and you can tell them, if you don't accept Yeshua, you're going to hell, but you can't cry at that same time, then better not to say it at all. I don't hear God saying, ah, I get to throw down all my wonders. I get a sense of Rahmanus, this mercy, this compassion that's coming out of God where he says, I really wanted to draw these people to myself, but they didn't get it. And Pharaoh was the bad guy in the story. Now the Lord said to Moses, tell everybody, let's start all over. So we're going to get a new calendar, chapter 12. We're getting a new calendar. Everybody take some blood, paint it on the door, and let's get out of town. Let's get started again. Covenants in the Bible, agreements, contracts between God and people are always sealed with blood. We do it in modern days, don't we? If you go to Ethiopia, say, and you find a blood brother or blood sister. You ever heard that phrase? You know how they do it? They actually take a knife of some kind and cut it. Kids do it all the time. And they merge their bloods together, right? And we become blood brothers, right? So this idea of blood brothers is a biblical idea blood covenant. Every covenant, every agreement between God and people was confirmed or ratified with blood. So here it is, this covenant that God's making with the Jewish people is sealed with blood. First the blood of lambs and then in just a few chapters we're going to see it, the blood sprinkled, tossed all over the people of God at Sinai. And that'll be pretty remarkable. So this idea of the tenth plague is escapable for some and it's escapable certainly for Jews, it's the first time we've had to do anything to get out of a plague. All the other plagues happened all around us and we were safe. But this one, although he's going to make a distinction, isn't that what he said in chapter 11? He's going to make a distinction so that it won't touch us. There's still an action. Here we go in chapter 11, verse 7. Whether against man or beast, that you may understand, that you may know actually, how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So it's almost as if he says, it's not going to touch you. But here's how you can be sure that it won't touch you. 
if you kill this lamb and put the blood on the door. And why does it say on the two sides and the lintel? That's kind of weird. Like, why does he give us painting directions? That's the sign of the cross. There are two ways people see this. Yeah, if you touch the top, that's the lintel of the door. So any, any door. The top and the two sides, that's not a cross. Ah, but it'll drip down from the top. And so you get the two sides and the lintel, and it drops down. So you get the sign of the cross that way. I've seen it another way, where the two sides and the lintel form the Hebrew letter F. Hi. That's right. So I'm going to give you life through the blood. I know some people who think that blood is a little gory and sacrifices don't seem to make much sense. Why would God care to kill an animal? What does that do? Why does killing a lamb spare me? Because you will see the lamb being killed because of your sin and it will make you to repent. Because I feel and believe that in those days the Israelites were a bit barbaric and they need a bit of blood to be spilled to see that they are in the wrong. It's a Whenever deterrent. They, sin, okay. they, they suffer as a result. They confess the sin and they are freed from their sin. That was the rabbis here. I learned it from the yeshiva. And the sacrifice, if you will, the loss of your money. Hmm. It's expensive. Look what it costs to go per kilo to buy anything in the shops today. Imagine what that would be if you bought a whole lamb whole animal before it was butchered etc the blood by reason of the life extends to us life it's quoted in Vayikra in due course Leviticus it says I've given it the blood to you on the altar to make atonement kapora for your souls for it is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement blood by reason of life that makes atonement so God wants to repair his relationship with us and we can't do it Every time we try, we muck it up. Every time we try to fix things spiritually or religiously, we might do a little something, but really we make the matters worse, generally speaking. We think we're doing well in religion, and then we get proud in our religion, and that's not good. Or we think we're doing okay, and then we don't do well, so we get condemned, and condemnation's no good in religion. So whichever way we go, we're wrong. And the only one who can fix it is the one who designed the whole thing in the first place. And he makes atonement for us. And the way he did that, Vayikra, Leviticus, tells us in chapter 17 that it's the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. So there's an exchange. It may not seem fair if you were a lawyer representing the Lamb Club, the Lamb Rights Institute or something, but God set it up this way. By the way, if you couldn't afford the lamb, you could bring a turtle dove or two. But it's the blood of these animals by reason of their life that makes exchange of life possible. It costs us. And you're right. What you learned in yeshiva is just right. We would be pained to see the loss of life. And I don't want to do that. I don't want that little lamb to suffer. I don't want Bambi over here, the deer, to die on my behalf. I'm so sorry. I've got to kill you so that I can be repaired. I'll never do this again. I mean, that's the idea. Rahmana should hit us in such a way that we should change. Exactly. So it's not like every day, well, I sinned again. Give me that lamb. Give me the knife. Slice yeah, forgiven. You know, it's not that. It's not cavalier. It is humble. And that's how it works. So Moses went out from Pharaoh 11.8 in hot anger. I want to ask you, isn't Moses supposed to be a virtuous person? Why did he go out in hot anger? He should calm himself. <laughs> well, look, when you're in the heat, as it's called, of the moment, and you're in final conflict in this climactic moment, with your enemy, a brutal enemy for a year. And it's possible, according to the movies, that Moses and Pharaoh kind of grew up together. If that be so, then it's the last time. Remember, he said, you'll never see me again. So look at the end of chapter 12. After he talks about leaven and getting leaven out of the house, seven days you can't see it, etc. It says, chapter 12, verse 23, the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians that word smite 12.23 and when he sees the blood on the lintel the top of the door and on the two doorposts the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer Hashachat to come into your houses to smite you and you shall observe this event this event as an ordinance forever and ever at least until it's over is the destroyer an angel of the the Lord the angel of the Lord yeah angel of death yep 
I mean, it doesn't say angel of death. Hashachat is, is all it says. <laughs> so the destroyer is the nickname for the angel of death. Malach HaMavet. We got a phone call once in New York City at the Jews for Jesus office. And it was somebody who didn't know the story and he answered the phone. And the guy on the other end said, his name was Malachi Mavis. And he'd like to speak to the leader. Oh, he's not there? Let me give you my number. And it was a fake number, but it was Malachi Mavis. Malach HaMavit, the angel of death. He wanted to have a go. (laughs) Sometimes we get these. In verse 25, when you get into the land, as the Lord promised... You shall observe this right. So look how the timeline collapses. Chapter 11, I'm going to predict the last plague. Chapter 12, the last plague, let's get you out of there. And then when you get into the land, that's 40 years later, and you're observing Pesach, then this is what you're supposed to do. When your children ask you, what does this mean? Then you have this liturgical response. God passed over the houses of us. He's delivered, we'll get it, he spared our homes, verse 27. Pesach means Passover, does it? No, yes and no. Pesach is the lamb itself. Pesach, like Pascha, like Paschal lamb. It's the lamb, the agent of redemption. Passover is the product of redemption. That is, the result of the redemption is that the angel passed over our houses and we were spared. Modern day people love Passover, but not necessarily Pesach. We love the result of being forgiven or delivered, but we don't love the one who delivered us. Mm -hmm. And I like thinking of the Paschal Lamb, not the effect of the Lamb's agency. So it makes us into God people and not freed people. It makes me focused on the Almighty and not happy that, not only happy that I'm delivered. So if you get that, if you get that nuance, you will be a religionist that makes other people glad because you'll be focusing their lives on God and not on what they get out of God. Now, verse 29, it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh's head on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, all the firstborn of cattle. Interesting, it switched from the slave girl behind the millstone to the captive. So there's that midnight sound again of the destruction of Egypt, and it nailed everybody from the firstborn of Pharaoh. So it doesn't say Pharaoh, so we know that Pharaoh wasn't a firstborn to his son, to the firstborn of the captive. I like the way the phrase goes in verse 29. The firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne. throne. His throne. I'm the dominating one, says Pharaoh. I'm the king, and it's my throne. And God says, you think you're in charge? Go check your bedroom. To the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. So everybody, it's comprehensive. Why the cattle also? He is responsible for all the economy. It was almost like the Wall Street, the ASX of Egypt. And it's going to not only be the employment agencies who are hurting because there are no people to work there tomorrow, but also the shops are going to be closed. The economy is going to be affected. Politics is going to be affected. It's a comprehensive judgment on the gods of Egypt. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants, all the Egyptians, there's that great cry. There was no home where not anybody was dead. He called Moses, said, get up, get out of here, go worship God, take your flocks, your herds, go, and look at verse 32, bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we'll all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up and their clothes on their shoulders. Why did the Jewish people eat unleavened bread? Because they had to be in haste. Yeah. To do everything. Didn't have time. So you just took it as it was, pulled it out, looked more like tortillas (laughs) than it did loaves of challah or bread that we have today. Because we had to leave Egypt quickly. So they did according to the word of the Lord. They got from the Egyptian neighbors, verse 35, silver, gold, and clothing. And my guess is that the Egyptians said, here, take everything, get out of here. And the Lord had given people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and they plundered the Egyptians, and they got out of town quickly. And at the end of 430 years, to the very day, verse 41, everybody, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt, a night to be observed throughout our generations. 
And this is an ordinance. No foreigner is to eat it. No foreigner, verse 43, is to eat of it. But every man's slave, after you've circumcised him, he can eat it. Sojourners shouldn't. Hired servants should not. So it sounds like it's not for Gentiles. But verse 48, if a stranger does sojourn with you and celebrates it, then let his males be circumcised so they can be brought in. No uncircumcised person may eat of it. But it's not only for us. Please welcome people. Welcome them. They just have to change to become like you. So it's not us for no more. It's for everyone, but there are rules on how to engage and be participating. And on that same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts, al Tsipotan. So it's a great story so far as we see the deliverance of the Jewish people. We ached for it in chapter 1. God sent a deliverer, prepared him, and 80 years later got the people out. Not as quickly as we would have wanted. Several generations would have died as slaves in Egypt. It may not seem fair to you, but it's the way God did it. He prepared Moses, he prepared Pharaoh, he prepared the people of Egypt and prepared the people of Israel and it all coalesced on that Passover night. I think God is the God of history, don't you think so? He likes stories. He likes to make things go in stories and fables and what happened. The whole Bible is based on stories. Have you heard the word history broken into his story? It's God's story. And he lets us be part of it, which is pretty great. Whatever he did, he was going to answer the prayers of the people. And it always involves people. So it's not only a story of God. It's God with man at table or set down. It's somehow we are involved in the story from Genesis on. He created this, that, and the other. And then there's man. And then there's the woman. And then let's let it happen. And it happened. You've been listening to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus in Australia. For more information, contact Jews for Jesus, Post Office Box 925, Sydney, Australia 2001. God bless you.